this here is enough to make a man sick. This, this is the medicine. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm John, the host, and tonight I'm bringing you a review of 2019's Doctor Sleep, the sequel to the 1980 Stanley Kubrick classic, probably considered the pent-ultimate cult film, The Shining. But also, this is a sequel to 1977 Stephen King's novel, The Shining. This film took pieces from the novel and pieces from Kubrick's film, kind of tied it together, also adapting uh, the 2013 novel, Doctor Sleep, from Stephen King. So doing an episode of the Cult of Films on Doctor Sleep is basically my amendment to my best of 2019 film hooligans list, the top 10 favorite films of, of 2019. I did with my co-host Jason Alt on the Film Hooligan Show. I, at the time, I did not see Dr. Sleep, and if I did back then, this definitely would have not only bumped off something off the off my top 10 list, but probably been pretty high up there, because although this film was not received very well in the theater, it is now since found kind of a new early cult following on streaming sites. Right now it's on HBO Max, and let me tell you, this film is fucking fantastic. I absolutely love Dr. Sleep, and this is something that I don't say lightly, and probably most people that like Stephen King or even Stanley Kubrick say lightly, because when I saw the original trailer to Dr. Sleep, I was cautiously optimistic. I love Ewan McGregor, and I really liked Mike Flanagan. Mike Flanagan is responsible for The Haunting of Hill House, uh, Bly Manor, he did Oculus, and also another Stephen King adaptation in Gerald's Game on Netflix, which is very underrated. He has a very strong knack for the type of horror that I like. It's not big jump scary kind of horror. It's kind of like the equivalent of the original movie The Shining, where it's it definitely takes its time. He has longer run times to his films because he just kind of draws out tension and lets scenes develop and characters develop and lets scenes breathe. And it, it's not always about that quick, like, uh, begooled face jumping in your face, uh, making you say, you know, going boo and you going, ah, oh, oh, isn't that so much fun reading popcorn? And, you know, this is the type of film that's going to survive the test of time like the, sh the original Shining did when all the movie theaters don't come back or take a long time to come back. This isn't a, a film for popcorn eating teens to watch to take your dates to this is definitely more of a, a slow burn and it's something that you could kind of enjoy it, it might actually probably benefited for being a a short mini series itself but uh there is a longer extended uh director's cut version of this film which is uh incredible as well but i am just going to be kind of talking about everything that's included in the theatrical release. This movie wasn't made for a ton of money either. It had a, a budget of around $50 million. It only made $72 million. So for all intents and purposes, it's kind of a, a box office financial failure, especially when you put it up to its its peers in the Pet Cemetery reboot and the two It movies that, that made boatloads of money each. Even if that Pet Cemetery reboot was terrible, uh, th this movie probably did the least well financially. And in my opinion, this is head and shoulders above all three of those films, blows those films out of the water because this just has that right tone of a Stephen King adaptation. Is this as good as The Shining? Of course not. I'm not saying that. That is one of the most well-crafted films, not just horror films, but films of all time. And I don't think I would hear too many people argue about that, maybe except for Stephen King. But like, I, what this is, is it's a modern day, at least cult classic in the making. It only came out last year, but I think this is a movie that when we kind of stop talking about the It reboot and, and like the, the Stranger Things culture kind of or the fad kind of dies out and fades away a little bit not saying that you know stranger things or any of that like 
nostalgia, you know, regurgitation is just terrible. But this just has such a better structure to stand on its own and to kind of live on past its years where those other films like the the latest adaptations of, of King novels just kind of fell flat. Like it just feels so empty compared to something as fleshed out as Dr. Sleep. And they had two films to get that one right, like the, like the old miniseries. But I think that there is just so much more... Uh, emotional connection to the characters in Doctor Sleep than either, than any of those movies. So let's talk about the cast. Ewan McGregor, as a, it's great to see him in a in a leading role once again. I mean, lately he's just been kind of relegated to supporting characters, and, and just like lately he's just had those kind of smaller roles, which he does fine in. I'm just saying that. There was a time, especially back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, when Ewan McGregor was basically your leading man. He was up there with, you know, a lot of his peers. Like, Ewan McGregor used to, to headline quite a bit of films back then, and, and he's kind of taken it back a little bit as far as the, the roles that he's been he's been chosen for, or at least the roles that he's going for. This was a nice, refreshing role for him because... He once again kind of shows that he can do this thing. He can carry a movie and very well. And it's not like he is super charismatic, like back in his train spotting days. He is just like broken down, you know, older Danny Torrance kind of going through the motions of life uh, or, you know, kind of unmaking his own life, being such an addict and, and going down the road of his father. The arc that they give Danny Torrance in this film is tragically beautiful and that's not to say that Ky like newcomer kylie curin uh is isn't fantastic as well i mean she is one of the she puts on one of the best child performances in any film and especially in like a horror film that that's harder to do she was a vision so great as abra stone and there's also some some other minor roles for other childhood actors jacob tremblay <laughs> puts on Quite a performance in the in the small role that he a small but important role that he has in this film. So uh, across the board, like the kid actors are just like nail it. Also, the kid that they cast to be young Danny Torrance in this is also fantastic. This does what I wish <laughs> most films would do nowadays. Like all the MCU and Star Wars and all that, they all are kind of grave robbing old dead actors and you know CGIing poorly their face onto other actors uh, like your Grand Moff Tarkins or even some other spoilery stuff that just happened in another Star Wars show that's pretty current, so I don't want to, you know, really uh, spoil that too much. But they don't do that. They cast actors that kind of, at the, at the very least, resemble the actors that they're trying to be. Like Henry Thomas, who plays the bartender, who is basically Jack, he does a great job. He's not he's not doing like a, a Vegas impersonator uh, performance of Jack Nicholson. It's very subtle. Like he just, he does a couple of facial expressions like him. He doesn't like look like him totally, but enough to, to where you don't have to guess who the hell is, is Ewan McGregor talking to right now. Which, you know, that's one of the strongest scenes in the entire film that's a lot to put on him and they both do it perfectly uh the the person that they cast to do wendy torrance was played by shelly duvall back in 1980 alex esso does oh my god it's like you have to double take it she does such a good job of being wendy torrance oh you know also being shelly duvall a little bit but, but invoking the character of wendy torrance uh, just everyone that was cast to do these roles, that, the the past virgins, like Carl Lumbly as Dick Halloran, it's uncanny how well they did in this. Where you're just like, you know, you know, the first five seconds, you're like, well, that's not Scatman Crothers, but you know, at least they tried. But once he starts delivering his lines and seeing the interaction he has with wh whoever is playing Danny Torrance at the time, whether it be the the new little kid or you and McGregor, you're just like, yeah, that is. Dick Halloran. This story revolves around, like I said, a older Danny Torrance. He's kind of gone through it and he's kind of at the end of his rope and he forces himself into a somewhat intervention, starts going to like AA meetings and he kind of takes himself off the map until he meets up with Cliff Curtis's character and he kind of takes him under his wing, gives him some jobs, uh, introduces him 
to some some people just to get them on the straight and narrow and away from the bottle until another character, Abra Stone, uh, played by Kylie Kieran, uh, reaches out to him because she is like the kind of Professor X of these these people with the shining and her powers are kind of like danny torrance's on crack she starts reaching out to ewan mcgregor is this like kind of sweet little pen pal thing you know, where, where this other group of characters known as the true not cult abra has to kind of employ danny uh for his help uh because these this group of psychic vampires are now after Abra because her essence is so strong. And th and that's another thing is this movie has great villains, or at least one really great villain and then some good secondary villains. And, th and that's led by Rebecca Ferguson as Rose the Hat, who is just so charming and gorgeous and everything that you would want a psychic vampire to be, I guess. She's the leader of this group. It's basically her and Crow Daddy, <laughs> played by Zahn McLaren, who who is fine, who puts in a, a good enough performance, as well as uh, Emily Allen Lynn, that plays Snake by Andy, and even a little uh, Adam's Family Lurch action, or for all you David Lynch Twin Peaks fans, the fireman, uh, Carol Stricken, plays Grandpa Flick as part of the True Knot gang. He's like the elder statesman. And this group is is really terrifying. They look like people, but they are just there to all feed off little children with the shining. The older you are, the, your essence kind of sours over time or it doesn't become as strong. So they it, it's just such a like a horribly disturbing premise that they just find these like super special children they lure them in in a really disgusting way just to basically brutally murder them and and feed off their essence and keep it in a jar for later i'm not one that likes depicting violence towards children at all it's just one of those things that i i just am not a fan of watching in any horror movie but the way they do it in this is brutal they're not doing it for that like disgusting shock value. They're doing it because it serves the story and it's kind of essential to, to moving the plot forward. And it, it it's, I don't want to say it's like in, done in an artistic way, but I mean, it, it's, it's like watching, it's, it's like similar to watching like Bette Midler suck the essence out of like Thora Birch in uh, Hocus Pocus, but a little bit with a little bit more stabbing and blood involved. So then it becomes kind of a cat and mouse game. It's these two, you know, gifted factions trying to outsmart one another and set me mental traps for one another. And it just is so fun. Half the time it plays out like a superhero film or even like an anime. In my mind, I don't know why I was doing this, but I could see like Miyazaki doing this film or, or someone or another anime director that's like a little bit more brutal, but it plays out like that. It almost plays out like a, like a storybook fable because it's not just like a stereotypical horror film. It, it just feels very grim fairy tales at times. It does feel like it pays homages to other more cerebral type of uh, horror films. The score by the Newton brothers is fantastic. There is like an overlaying heartbeat in like 80% of the film. And sometimes it's really effective to kind of give you that backbone of just like something's going down or, you know, something's about to happen, which doesn't usually lead to a jump scare. Sometimes it does, but all the all the jump scares, and I think there's probably like maybe two or three in the entire film, are all earned. It's not just like, you know, a, a coffee pot falling over or a cat jumps out of a closet. It's all very earned because most of the time it, it's, it's like slow pans around a room or something and then you you know, slowly see a hand come out of somewhere or slowly see uh, an apparition. It's more of that, like, anticipation of dread that you're just like, oh, shit, I know something's coming, and it is. Oh, my God. And it's like, I can't do anything about it. And that's what's really creepy, right? That's what feels so nightmarish. And this this film feels very dreamlike. It feels like a lucid dream. When Rose the Hat, you know, mentally teleports herself to, to go track down Abra, and it's just like kind of it's it's very dreamlike where she's flying over the world and, and like there's fi literal like filing cabinets in someone's mind that you, that people are going through. It's those things where it, it's it feels more of like a fantasy film than an actual horror film, even though some like the horror tones he nails up too, because there is some 
really disturbing imagery in this film. Uh, like I said, child murder galore, but also not just that, genuinely creepy moments and some really cathartic moments. And I'm going to spoil just a, a tad bit. There is a scene in the beginning, it's part of the flashback, where it, it kind of sets up a, a little bit of time has passed after Wendy and Danny Torrance has left the Overlook Hotel and Danny is being haunted, basically, by the woman in the bathtub from the room 237. After he gets a nice, like, talking to with, with the ghost of, of Dick Halloran and he kind of gives him the tools to make these, like, these ghosts just, like, stop coming for him or, or you know, just kind of leave him alone... I just love that scene where you see the bathroom in their new apartment or house or whatever is like at the end of the hallway and you could, you just like see the creepy hand and the woman just get out of the bathtub and stand up like, like the old shining movie. And he just like calmly walks in and just closes the door behind him. It's just such a cool cathartic scene. And it was like little me that was just like terrified of like, Chucky and like Freddy Krueger from back in the day. I, I literally would would like take posters of them and just like roll them up and just like and, and then like throw them away. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to be afraid of these things anymore, little John. And it was just like one of those moments where I'm like, damn, that is that is just so cool. And that's like an ongoing theme throughout the movie where he just finds ways to the the things that are that are haunting him from the past he finds a way to lock them up. And, and I just loved that so much, how, how they handled that in this film. So let's talk about the big <laughs> elephant in the room, 237, and in the rest of the Overlook Hotel. That The Overlook Hotel. This is an adaptation of a Shining sequel, like I said, from the book and the movie. So there's going to be fan service galore. And the movie, not the director's cut, because that's over three hours, but the movie itself is about two hours and 30 minutes. For the first two hours, besides that that small setup uh, scene, flashback scene in the beginning of the film, it's really not about any of that. Besides, we're following the character of Danny Torrance as as one of our main characters. But for the most part, it earns everything. It earns that big fan servicey crescendo at the end. And do they do they cross the line sometimes? Yes. But is it a deal breaker? Fuck no, because it's just so cool. Like they they handle it in such a beautiful way where he literally and I guess this is my old spoilers, when they return to the overlook, you know, Danny Torrance is just like walking from room to room in a recreated set of the Overlook Hotel and it looks so perfect. And Room by room, you just see, like, lights slowly flicker on. Just that reoccurring heartbeat sound, and everything is super quiet. It's just like a child on the night before Christmas. I was just so giddy at everything they did in the Overlook Hotel. The ending, you know, I'm not going to spoil it too much. It is a little bit much. Uh, however, it's, again, not a deal breaker, because I think that they did enough to earn everything they got to do, all the fun stuff at the end. You were put through a, a very tension-filled and emotional ringer for two hours of this film, and we just got to have fun for the last 30 minutes. So thank you, Mike Flanagan. If you're going to do fan service and force-feed me chocolate cake till I die, that was the way to do it. This is a modern-day cult classic. This is definitely something for anyone that is a fan of the Kubrick film or Stephen King in general, especially The Shining, or just the the. 2013 book of Dr. Sleep itself, this is a must watch. And people are really starting to to pick up on this and starting to give it a chance now that it's on streaming services. And I could see that it probably wasn't the best experience in theaters. And that's fine. Not everything is meant for theaters. And really today, you know, nowadays, nothing is meant for theaters. We'll see if that changes anytime soon. But Dr. Sleep is uh, at least like an eight out of 10 type film. I love this. Being such a Stephen King fan, uh, a, a fan of Dark Tower, coming from a place where I'm a person that was extremely let down by It and It Chapter 2 in Pet Cemetery, all these new kind of adaptation of, of King novels, this renewed my excitement. I, I'm even super excited now uh, more so than I was for the new stand adaptation of that, that mini series that's being uh, released on CBS. So check out Dr. Sleep. I can't wait to see what Mike Flanagan does next. He is just one of those 
I, I think he's really up there with your Robert Eggers and your Ari Asters in this new renaissance of horror directors. His name absolutely belongs in the new era of, of like cult horror masters. So that's my review of 2019's Doctor Sleep. Do you agree with me? Did you see this film? And if you did uh, and you didn't like it, let me know down in the comments why you didn't like it. Was it too fan servicey? Was it not? Did they not lean too hard, you know, far enough into The Shining? I, I can't imagine anyone would have that. <laughs> that take, but I mean, maybe, maybe if you were just looking for The Shining 2, Danny Torn's Boogaloo, maybe, you, you know, I could, I guess I could see you being upset with this, but I, I think this film was just stellar. So leave in the comment section if you agree with me or not. If you want to let people know that I'm talking about films and everyone else I have on here on The Cult of Films, let people know on Twitter. I am simply at The Cult of Films, or if you want to talk to me personally on Twitter, I'm at John the Host. Uh, I will be uploading this to all your favorite podcasting sites like iTunes and Spotify. Leave us ratings there. Leave me, you know, room 237 key keychains. That would be that would be the shit, actually. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>